Yeah, well, we thank you for today. We ask that you bless the words that are going to be shared here. We ask that you would give Eric wisdom abundantly and help him to focus on your word and all that he wants to share. Father, we thank you for those that have gathered here and we ask for open hearts that we can understand who you are in a greater way. In your mighty awesome name I pray, amen. 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 All right, everybody turn off the cameras and everybody turn off the cameras and the microphone. We'll see you in an hour. OK, so here's parts 11 and 12 of the continuing study of Ezekiel. We started with Ezekiel 16 and we're going to. Uh, we're in 20, we'll go to about 22 and then jump ahead. Something in 22 and 23. A few years ago, there was another study that I was involved with, and someone said, would you shut up about this Mishkan pattern thing all the time? We're trying to talk about the language, the, the words, the meanings of the letters and things, but why this, let's call it a fascination with the Mishkan pattern. So the phrase Tabanit Mishkan is used in Exodus 25. And in my understanding, just so you know, it's the not just the heart, it's the heartbeat, I might say, of this whole study. So I'm gonna I'm gonna address that for a reason based on something we were talking about in the after show last week. There's this phrase, get her done. It's like, yeah, that's just like this English uh, slang jargon to get, ju just go do it. Gitter, gitar, gitar, gimel dalit rash, hyphenated to gimel dalit rash. We were looking at this verse, Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And it says that Yahuwah is bakash, which is searching or seeking. But it also means pleading emphatically. It's like, please, would somebody? And then it's just the word ish, Aleph Yod Sheen, which is the word for man. And you look in the dictionary and it means it could be anybody, just, just somebody. And then he ends up the verse by saying, Lomata, which is Lamed Aleph is the negative, no, or non, not. And then matzah is memzadi aleph, which is the ability to find what you're looking for. So the interesting thing about the Mishkan pattern is that there's the big white fence. And some people say, like these three colors here, that maybe they were striped all the way around on linen. And so it wasn't a white fence at all. Maybe it was just this three colored fence. The embroidery, certainly, the embroidery colors of the Mishkan, of the priest garments, it always says, there's like 20 something times, 25 times or something in Leviticus, and then it's also, I think, in Numbers where it says blue, purple, red, white linen, and then occasionally it'll say gold threads. Just so you know, the, um, the design of this, blue, purple, red, whether the blue's on top or the red's, I don't know that that matters, but there's a thin gold line, pinstripe line within the white. Just kind of, why? Why did he pick those colors? But why is there this pattern, this tabanit? And if you just look simply at the spelling of the word, tav, bet, nun, yod, tav, and then you start thinking, well, the letters mean something and the words spelled mean something. So how do we go about this procedure, which we've been doing for a few years and there's hundreds of hours of this study. I'm readdressing it for a reason based on this verse, Exodus, or Ezekiel 22, verse 30. So the letter Tav is a mark. Literally, it means a mark, a sign. It's just a, it's a, if you do a squiggle, that's a tav. If you have a logo of a company, that's a tav. If you have a musical note, even if you don't know what note it is, or if you have a treble clef, you know, oh, oh I, I know that that represents music. 
well, okay, that's a mark. That's a, a scribble that means something. There's a there's a concept that's identifiable that's attached to the scribble. That's the meaning of the word tav, or some people say tau, T-A-U. Whether it's a T-A-V or T-A-U, it's spelled with the letter vav, and whether the vav is pronounced as wa, just so people know, U-A-W is the way I write it because it's got the U sound, wa. Some people write W-A-W, some people V-A-V. -V. It's all the same letter. Hey, look, he's the vav, man. The vav or the wow? He's the wow man. Or the... At some point, as much as there's analysis of <laughs> how do you do this accurately, you bump into this kind of a wall where it's no longer accurate. In other words, people have said nobody really, even the scribes and Pharisees and scholars, sages, they don't know how David would have articulated this language, how he actually spoke. The dots and lines underneath the letters in modern Hebrew called nikud, nikt, nikud, like nikadamon, nikdemus, same name. It means to, like if you are moving furniture and you bump into the door jam and you nick the furniture, you've nicked NKD, nicked, or it's actually NQD, nakad. You've put little dings and marks in something. It's the same word in English to nick something, nick and dent. You might get a discount on the cosmetics of a piece of appliance or furniture or something. So we did that study on Nicodemus. Well, if it ends in US, that's Greek masculine singular. In the ISR version of the scriptures, trans or transcribes his name as Nicodemon, Nicodemon, Memnun suffix. Well, that's Hebrew. Then what does that mean? And so we did this study based on what the letters mean. So if you say, well, Nobody really knows how the language was pronounced, but we have the consonants. All the other letters pretty much are, except the ayin. The ayin and the vav are the two letters that slip around. The sheen can be an s or an sh. So in the Middle Ages, what's called the Masoretes, the Masora, the Masora scribes, Masoretic scribes, Jewish scholars put these dots and lines under the modern letters, and those are called the vowel points. So just, just so people know, for the record, there is no, technically there's no vowels in Hebrew other than the dots and lines, which were added many years later to lock in a certain way of pronouncing, pronouncing, pronunciation. But the yods and vavs and the ayin and maybe even the aleph, but the aleph is technically silent. They, they kind of act like vowels. The ayin has kind of an A or an E or an O or a U sound. The yod can be a, a I or a Y. It became the letter J. The vav can be an O or a U or the W sound. But by default, all the other letters just have this ah. But that's not really true because in order to get it to be pronounced as an ah or a eh or uh, all the different vowel noises are the different lines and dots underneath. Well, if there are no lines and dots, then it all had to be handed down word of mouth, mouth to ear, generation after generation. And then you get people in different parts of the neighborhood that speak differently. So there's that little event, shibboleth, S-H, the way some people spoke it, and sibboleth, the way other people spoke it. And depending on how you pronounced it, you were a friend or foe, and there was a war going on, and people got killed for the pronunciation, uh, disclosed their otherwise camouflage of who they were. So every once in a while, how you pronounce something makes a difference. How you pronounce the sacred name, the tetragrammaton, the four-letter yod heh vav hey, or even the aleph hey yod hey eh. I would say eh yeh. Other people say ahaya. Which is it? It could be either one, because if the aleph is silent, it's 
So you say eh just because it's kind of a default, the most neutral vowel sound. Aleph hey would be ha, and yod ya. Yod, yod is ye. And then the other ah sound, ah haya. Or is it eh hiye? Well, eh hiya. Again, if you're wrapping your mind around this, it's it's kind of up to you. But what do the letters mean? So the meaning of the letters by everybody agrees. Aleph means ox. Look in the dictionary, look in the lexicon. Aleph is also the number one or the number 1,000. So what do you do with that? Well, you can think if it's ox and it's, if it's both one and 1,000, like I said last week, you could have an engine with 454 horsepower. It's like 454 horses pulling a carriage. How fast can you go? How easily can they pull it? So is an ox worth 1,000 men? One ox equals 1,000 other. Well, it's just that concept. Okay, so if I if I say okay, I, I could go along with that. Then somebody somebody told me once the a great scholar was talking about the meanings of these letters over in Jerusalem, and he says you can't tell me every time there's an aleph in a word it's referring to an ox. Well, I didn't say that, nor did I ever imply that or mean that. Just so for the record, making it clear here that no, if just because there's a dalit in a word doesn't mean that it's actually a door. But what does the door represent? What does a door mean? Now, so if I try to wrap my mind around this door concept, well, if somebody shows you the door, are they telling you to leave or are they saying that you're allowed to leave? Your option, your choice. So if a door represents this room or that room or inside versus outside, that that means you can choose. You have the volitional prerogative to determine which side you're on. So if somebody said, look, I'm not going to tell you which way to pronounce the word shibboleth, but if you pronounce it as sibboleth, you're on that team and shibboleth is on this team. So you you choose which team are you on? Well, it's kind of like uh, I've, I've, I've made this, presented this predicament before. This This is serious stuff we're talking about. And I know, I, I was taught that, and I mentioned about this evangelism explosion. Say you die and you go to the pearly gates and somebody says, why should I let you in? St. Peter standing at the gate, why should I let you in? How do you think you have any right to be granted entrance to this, whatever the celestial kingdom is beyond the pearly gates? It's like, I was a good person. <clears throat> Don't get in. What? Oh, wrong answer. It's kind of like, do you have oil? Uh, uh, did, did somebody tell us to bring extra oil? <laughs> they told us to be here dressed up, ready to go out on time, which we were. They told us to have these lamps. Did they tell us to bring extra oil? Uh, those five have extra oil, but hey, he was late. It's not my fault. <clears throat> Don't get in. What? Come on, man. Who makes up these rules and what are they? Who says, okay, well, I, I learned that Jesus said, hey, without me, nobody gets into my father. I'm, I'm the door. Nobody gets into the heavenly kingdom unless through me. So if you had a door that said Jesus, so there's two pearly gates. One says Jesus and the other one says yod heh vav -Hey. And you were told, listen, you go up and knock on the door. And if you pick the wrong door, a trap door opens up and you straw, drop straight down into the fiery Lake, the lake of fire, the hell. Which door do you go to? Do you go to the door that says Yode Vavhe, or do you go to the door that says Jesus? Knowing that Jesus said, nobody gets to my father except through me. If you presume to just walk in to my father's, got his name on it, I'm just going to, you know, come boldly before the throne of grace. It's like, you're done. Trap door, you're going down. It's like, yeah, but, I mean, I, Jesus is the name above all names, the sacred name, but there was no letter J. 
So it can't be pronounced Jesus, and therefore it's not the sacred name. It's a lie. That, that's just not true. There was no letter J. Look at the King James Bible. It started with the letter I, which would be the iota in Greek. It was written in Latin. It was not J. It can't be J. So if I go to the door that says Jesus, all my learning tells me that's a trick. It's not true. Even though there was a good story, a great story, a wonderful, the greatest story ever told is behind that name. But yet, if I look at yod heh vav -He, and then I read these verses where he says, I'm the only other Elohim. Israel, I'm your Elohim. Your father, your Dodi, your beloved. Beside me, there's no other. Yeah, let's go for this other one. It's like, why did Israel keep getting kicked around? We were reading in Ezekiel 20. Generation after generation, Israel has this propensity. It just does. It's not like any of our particular faults, but it's, it's up to us to correct the misalignment. But it's not our fault for in having been taught and being born into a culture where they tell us certain things. I, I was taught that Sunday is the Sabbath day and Jesus Christ is our Lord God, Savior, Savior, Redeemer, Deliverer. And I see in, in Isaiah that Yahuwah is our Savior, Redeemer, Deliverer. And then I have to sit there and say, well, Yeshua is Yahuwah. <laughs> Easy. They're both called the Lord. Done. Let's move on. It's like, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. No, no, we, we don't have to wait a minute. There's no problem now. Jesus is Yahuwah. And let's move on. There's more important things. Well, there's more important things unless you're standing at this imaginary gate. Two pearly gates, one says Jesus and one says Yahuwah, and now you have to, you know, ring the doorbell of the right door. And if it's the wrong, the, the trap door opens to the lake of fire. Who, who, which door are you going to choose? It's like, why should I present myself with such a dilemma? Might be just stupid, might be wrong, might be ignorant and foolish of me. Just, just make it easy. Well, the more you think about it, the more it's not so easy. Because if Jesus was never his name, his, never, his mother never called him that, well, how do I know? Because, you know, in, in Isaiah, somewhere around 60 or so, I think, I forget exactly where, but, but Yahuwah says, hey, Cyrus, I've called him by name, and he's going to send my people back to Jerusalem. It's like, Cyrus wasn't even born yet. Yes, that's right. But he certainly projected the name out there. Wow, that was a prophetic move, prophetic declaration. So even though that Yeshua was the common name, or Yahusha was the common name, Joshua, used among the Jews in Israel, the days of the Romans, maybe the angel did tell his mother Mary, or Miriam, call his name Jesus. I can't prove he didn't. What if he did? Then this whole argument, ah, there was no letter J, phooey, is bogus. Nobody knows. Where do you find on record that his name was written down one way or the other? The angel might have told his mother, call his name Jesus. Gosh. See, I have to decide what I'm going to do with this. And if I say the U.S. ending is Greek, masculine and singular, so it's not Hebrew, which is why in the Latin, and they called him Yesu. We might write that in English letters, Y-E-S-U, Yesu. But there was no S that was added because it was Greek, masculine, singular. And there was no J sound in Hebrew or Greek. But yet in Arabic, a jinn, spelled G-I-N, there's the jinn you drink, it's a spirit, alcoholic spirit, because a jinn, like a genie, G-E-N-I, it literally is some sort of uh, spirit manifest, evil spirit, or you know the type of genie in a bottle sort of concept, the idea that there's these uh, disembodied entities ghost-like spirit, that's a jinn. So 
They were called that before 500 years ago. So is it even true that there was no J sound? I, I don't know. See, you hear stuff. And suddenly, I presume the burden for myself. I got to make sense of these things. Why? Because if I read in the scripture, all who call on the name of Yahuwah will be saved. The name Yahuwah is a tower of refuge, inescapably, or you can, you can insurmountably high where you can find escape from anybody pursuing you. Hello? Hey, call in the name of Jesus. Okay, that's not the name. <laughs> if we're told to call in the name of Yahuwah and we call on the name of Jesus, we better hope there's a you know an automatic translation device happening in the spiritual realms. Otherwise, we're not going to be saved from that event. And yet I know people that called out on Jesus and got miraculous stories to tell. So why are we making such a big stinking deal about all this stuff? People have a ticket to heaven. They've got a ticket on the rapture bus. They've got a confident Holy Spirit as a token of deposit within them. Why do they need Paleo Hebrew? Seems like such a, an annoying waste of time, waste of effort, a cerebral annoyance. Why torment myself? with these things. Wouldn't it be better if I just went and fed the hungry, helped the widow and the orphan? If I wanna bring up some spiritual points, <laughs> why, why this? Well, because Yahuwah said, then you'll know that I am Yahweh. How many times did he say that through these chapters in Ezekiel? Many. Many times. Then you'll know that I am Yahweh. What does he mean by that? We addressed this a couple of weeks ago. Then you'll know ki ani Yahweh. Kaf yod. Like I said, the letter kaf is an open hand and the yod suffix means it's my own. So it's like he's almost like raising his own hand and but that doesn't designate who you are, but the concept, cough is a prefix letter, means like. Key is a word, means thus, for, because, when, while, although. In this case, when he says Kiani Yawa, he's, he's almost like holding up his hand and swearing a vow. And then Ani, Aleph Nun Yod. See, the first word in Exodus 20 is Anoki, Aleph Nun Kaf Yod. And the word for Nun Kaf, Nick, like Nick, only that's Nun Kaf, and the other Nicodemus would be Nun Kuf, NQ, not NK, but they're similar. But it means to plummet, like dropping a plumb line. I will plummet myself, Aleph Nun Kaf Yod which like being nicked and dented is to be reduced in value. So the word Anoki, Yahweh Eloheka, I'm Yahweh, your Elohim, Eloheka, your, the kaf suffix means yours, so Elohi, I'm your Elohim. The word Anoki means something about taking his existing prestige and aloofness, aloof, aloof, like aloof, like above and beyond, and dropping it down into our realm. Kind of like Joseph being thrown by his brothers into the pit of snakes and scorpions. Yahushua coming down here is like being thrown into a pit of vipers. Yeah, us, us humans, very dangerous place. But by, by lessening his capacity somehow as this Elohim essence, he took upon himself Ben Adam, the the, cons, the construct, but not Ben Nun Hay's construction. He took upon himself the construct of being in the form of Adam, of man. So I can say, well, listen, if I look at 
the, the, the difference between the letters Aleph and Bet. Aleph is silent and Aleph is beyond scope of wrapping your mind around where, why, how, what. You can't even pronounce it. As soon as you pronounce it, you've given it a, um, a tangibility, uh, something we can focus. So we can pronounce it like A or E or it's no longer Aleph. Because if you, if you take the definition of Aleph, that it's totally out of reach, beyond fathoming, beyond comprehension, behind, beyond grasp, well, no, I can I can imagine the concept of an Aleph. Well, now you've put it within grasp, so it's no longer Aleph by def by definition. But see, bet means to bet means house. Bet means to teach to, to be domesticated of the house. But so, if bet like a house is a body, is a substance, is an object, is a space. So an object and an object in space. Is, is both this bet thing. So bet's this matter, cosmos, being, just to exist. Because we don't know if you can use the word existence to define Aleph. Aleph is one who created what we call existence and, and the human mind being, a, being itself a projection of this word in John 1.1, The human mind can only go as far as it's given the capacity to go. And we're only given the capacity to picture, to fathom, bet, and everything you might say after the letter bet, but we can't, we can't even imagine or picture Aleph because by his design, which is an incredible invention, he designed it that Aleph is beyond our imagination, beyond our reference, behind our scope, behind any tool, device, or logical maneuvering we might do. Aleph is always outside of it, something else. And as soon as we think we can grasp it, oh, no, that's, that's, that's still a bet, because bet is something of substance that we can touch, that we can rattle around inside, that we can get outside of and look at and define, give it size and shape and time and volume and that's all bet stuff. Yeah, but somebody else might say bet is just house. It's like, okay. And somebody else might say, listen, you draw the number, the, the number two in English. It's got the curved top and it comes down to the bottom and it's got a flat bottom. Well, that looks like the modern bet, which is two. The number two and the second letter. So are what we call Arabic numerals, the number two is a version of the letter bet in modern Hebrew, just is. But if you look at the paleo bet, some people draw it square form. I draw it like this embryonic shape on purpose because it, it speaks more than the square form right angle, like the beginning of a maze, you know, it's the beginning of a spiral drawn in square form. So the orthography of the letters we use affects what we think of when we see that letter. So if somebody says, look it, the letters don't mean anything. Miles Jones, Michael Heiser, Michael Brown, the letters mean nothing. They're simply phonetics. Well, I, I, I disagree. And not just me, but you can see online, there's been over the years, there's been Jewish authors that have written about the meanings of the letters. Of course, they're now referencing the modern Hebrew flame letters. And then someone might be quick to say, yeah, but that's all Kabbalah. That's occult Jewish mysticism, by golly. Out of bounds. Unf don't even go there. What is, what is Kabbalah? It's always spelled with a K, but it's actually the letter Kuf. If you look in the um, dictionary, Kuf, Bet, Lamed, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. That almost sounds like where we get the word C-A-B-A-L, like a conspiracy theory sort of stuff. Cabal, a secret grouping of people behind the scenes covertly. Anything of espionage and uh, intrigue. The, the point is, 
wait a minute. If if in B, and I've heard people say you're doing Kabbalah and sh- shut up. And it's like I, I haven't studied Kabbalah. I don't know anything about Kabbalah. And it's like, yeah, but you're doing the same stuff they're doing. And it's like, well, what are they doing? They believe that the letters mean something. Okay, right there, they've just lost Michael Heiser and Michael Brown and Miles Jones and anybody else that wants to believe that. You know, I can mention that book, The Writing of God. That's what that's pushing, and that's okay. Now, Stan Tenen of Miru, M-E-R-U, Stan Tenen, uh, he died a couple of years ago, but he said that the meaning of the letters was retained in gesture. So if I go like this, pointing at myself, that's a gesture which is common even to primate m- monkeys, apes. Self-referential, if you get a big idea and whoo, well, this is some sort of a gesture of like your mind whoo, being enlightened. And so that's some sort of innate gesture that's just written into our psyche is another way to say it. And he found that it lines up with the Hebrew letters, modern Hebrew flame letters, the shapes of the letters. He can hold his hand a certain way and that, that's his whole study. And it's like, it's very profound as well as the fact that numbers have a, or the letters have a number value, which is called gematria. And some people maybe don't like that, but the Kabbalist boy, they get into that. And what that means is Aleph is one or a thousand, Bet is two, because it's the second letter, Gimel's three, and you go through all the letters. If it's base 10, then the letter Kaf would be, if Yod is 10, then Kaf is 20, and Lamed's 30. In fact, if you get a Tanakh, you'll see that that's the way the numbers are written in Hebrew. Kaf is 20, so Kaf Aleph is 21. The number 11, well, Kaf is the 11th letter. In fact, if you hold up your hands, so one way to draw the Kaf is a U shape with two, like four fingers, and you have your fifth finger. Hey, that's like the number 11 within the cup, you know. Happens to be the 11th letter. But they don't use that as 11. They use Yod Aleph as 11. And again, and I'm just saying, if you're trying to learn, so on Shavuot, if you're making like this, uh, we call it a uh, Advent calendar. At Christmas time when I was a kid, there was a little calendar, and every day you open up this little window and there was something in there, a Bible verse or something. And so... A few years back for Shavuot, 50 days of counting. Well, okay, wrap your mind around the letters. Aleph, what's an Aleph? And it says that on Shavuot, 50 days later, where the Talmudim, the disciples, were met together in the upper room, they were talking about the wonderful things that Elohim had done. I mean, Yeshua had just you know, lifted off from the Mount of Olives up into the sky in the clouds 10 days before, and they're like, well, is he coming back? Is it going to be next week? Maybe it'll be today, because he said he's coming back, but didn't know when. They didn't know it'd be another 2,000 years. Still waiting. But if they were rehearsing, what if what if we could count 50 by, just think of the Aleph concept. What's an Aleph concept? Well, unfathomable, undeterminable, out of reach. Now, what if we could we could imagine something about the truth that he's revealed to us in his word that's an Aleph-ness that we can say, hey, how great that is. Well, oh, what's Aleph? The fact that there is a reality beyond this universe, beyond this cosmos, beyond our experience of reality, which is more real than this is, and it's there, by golly, and there's no getting away from that. Well, unless you drop into the lake of fire because you picked the wrong name. But other than that, there's no getting away from that other bigger reality. And we'll get we'll see it when we when we go through the portal, the Dalit of death. Death is a door, a Dalit. Where we live in this universe, and then once we go through that portal of death, whether or not it's painful, it's an event, but we're gonna see that we're gonna see the Aleph realm. Okay, so the cosmos is this side of death for the mortal man. Okay, so Dalit's at least that kind of a transition event. So Aleph is that stuff out there. Okay, we can, we can say, okay, I, 
I can say, well, thank you for that. Or I can say, I'm just going to recognize that reality. That's Aleph. That's what Aleph means. Okay, well, what's Bet? Well, if Bet is the house, it's like the universe itself, the sky, the heavens, the earth, uh, our environment. And your baby, the only environment is your mother's womb. Once you're born, it's, it's the room you're put in, the bed, you're wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's your family around you. That's, that's your environment. So bets the, something about this experience or the fact that you have a consciousness in a body, your consciousness, which is indefinable, that's Aleph. That's to be a self, to be an identity, an Aleph in a body bet who is given mobility, Gimli. Well, some creatures have numerous little feet or little hairs that they can philia or flagellum or fins. I mean, there's different, you know, whether it's biped or like a millipede, milliped, thousand feet. He invented all kinds of different ways for us to move around. So if Gimel's a verb and bet's a noun, where do you move? Well, that's a decision. So Dalit might be the decision of where the gimel moves. And then we got, hey, do this. Well, now that's incoming information. Thank you from wherever that's uh, telling me that this is a better option. Don't eat that. It's poison. It's toxic. Oh, OK. Hey, why don't you go over here? If you go that way, the road's out. There's a cliff. You're going to get delayed or get hurt. So, oh, oh, oh. So there's incoming information that I need to then choose to engage, which is the Vav until I come to Zion, which is stop. Okay, well, there's seven letters. And on the other side of stopping, there's a whole new whole new world. That's Chet, this, this gated, fenced realm, a kingdom, a time and place. So is Chet uh, like the Aleph kingdom of heaven on the other side of this bet? Is the Chet an Aleph zone inside time and space? Yahushua said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within you, right? So the het is a zone within the bet. So I'm taking Bible verses that I treat, believe, that I trust, and then I'm trying to organize them according to the alphabet letters. And if the alphabet letters are in sequence, and the, the words mean something, Dalit means door, hey, doesn't mean something other than it means the, which is the point to. So if someone says, read the instructions, the instructions, which instructions? There's a bunch of them. Well, read the ones you can understand. They're written in half a dozen different languages. If you get them from Ikea, read the instruction, the, hey. So hey is to express. And if I go like that, it's like, hey, that's like the, the letter E or the letter hey. You know, hey, that's the way the figure is drawn. So, and I'm saying all this because I've heard people say even recently, oh, this is so difficult. Oh, I just can't get it. It's beyond my grasp. I'm too old for this kind of dirt thing. No, you're not. You already know it. I was telling somebody the other day, I've said it before. You already know the Hebrew alphabet in order. You know all the letters. You just don't know that you know. And if I go through this and you recognize, well, yeah, I already, I already believe that. If you believe the Christian gospel narrative, you believe that there's a, an almighty maker of heaven and earth. There's Aleph and Bet. And he gimmeled, he voyaged, he as an ambassador from the heavens came to, that's gimling, to the earth. Well, let's call that the Dalit. Why should I call a Dalit the earth? Dalit's drawn as a triangle. Well, not the modern Dalit. The modern Dalit is drawn, they'll show you like a door angle, like the like a square door. So that re representing four, four sides of a door hinged on one side. But if you if you had a door of ancient days, you took a, a skin of the height of an animal and you hung it up and it across the top and it hanged down, you can kind of see a triangle. And you can imagine the pelvic portal of a female being the birth canal as a triangle, a Dalit, is a way to get into this planet. Well, the hay is the feminine, feminine suffix. So if he came as a voyager from the heavens, Aleph, to the earth, 
being born through the dalit of a hey woman to be the vav, which is the masculine suffix, the man who would be. So Zion means to be adorned with weapons and also to be cut off. Well, Yahusha being notable. So a notable person would be an officer, a saint. They put a halo around his head because he's the notable one. And it's not always a circle, sometimes a triangle or square, depending on the artist. But different shapes meant something. But the point is to say, hey, this guy's significant. So for Pilate to say, behold this man, which in Latin would be ecce homo, literally say, look, there's the hay, the man, and then the, the Zion is, is Zion hay or Zion aleph tov means this. Zion hay hay means to identify as the identical. So for him to be this guy, we put a crown of thorns. Well, the crown is a Zioning. We beat him up with our weapons. That's a Zioning. He said, look at this man, this, that's a Zioning. So it's like, hey, Bob Zion, thank you, Mr. Pilot, is exactly identifying that guy, Yahusha, at that moment as being the one who came from Aleph as the bet gimling through Dalit, hey, as this Vav who was now Zion. And I can look at those first seven letters and say, that's absolutely Yahusha, without question. And what they do right after that, they Zion him, killed him and threw him in a tomb. Well, there's the hat round a big round rock. There's the tet. And he said, don't blame this on the Jews or the Romans. I myself have done this. What? How did you kill yourself? It's kind of like it's called suicide by cop. Do something stupid so the cops will shoot you and say, thank you, I'm out of here. He didn't do some stupid. He, he let himself get set up so that they would crucify him. And he says, nobody takes my life. I'm doing this of my own volition. This is all on me. And my father has given me the authority, the power, the whatever it takes to pick it up again, to pick it up again. So he did this whole thing. And then, well, if that's the yod, that strong arm of power, then you can read the word spelled yod kaf lamed, and it means the power and capacity to prevail and contain it all. So the word spelled kaf lamed is all. The yod prefix, he will all. He can all. He can prevail and contain even this measure of death. This circumstance subject that humanity is subject to, that Adam had bought the entire race. Hey, looks good to me. I'll take a bite out of the piece of fruit. And it's like, oh man, what'd he do? There's a little thing called a prion. And I heard some medical person many years ago say, as scientists analyze diseases, any disease that you, you can have cancer, you can have uh, tuberculosis, you can have the flu, you can have a headache, and it all can be boiled back to the same causal agent, which is called a prion. <laughs> Where'd that thing come from? So I can imagine that on that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that fruit had a prion in it. Adam and Hua did not have prions in them. And though Elohim didn't tell them the mechanics or the science of what was going to happen, he says, don't eat that fruit. The day you eat it, you're going to die. Eh, whatever. Well, they had to know what death was because so they because they must have seen leaves fall off the trees and die. Or they, did they see if they stepped on a bug, did it squish and die? I mean, how did they know what death was? Or it's like, don't need that tree or what is the word you will die is that meaningless or did they did it have meaning to them well how's that going to happen i'm not going to tell you how it's going to happen i'm just going to tell you don't eat that fruit or you're going to die okay don't eat that pork or you're going to get sick don't eat the shellfish fish got to have fins and scales or you're in big trouble no really Okay, so there's this thing called a prion like there's worms like there's toxins whether it's chemical or biological and apparently this prion got into humanity and then has morphed and permutated and changed into all the different diseases which we have. But if you can wind them back to a prion, it's like, yeah, that's, that's where that thing got in. And let's imagine that that prion not only 
re resulted in the toxicity of, of Adam's mortality, meaning he's going to come to his end of his life and die, but somehow because of the act of disobedience, of rebellion, he's dead dead. He can't, he can't get beyond that. So why did Yahusha come? Well, he came down to somehow change that and blow through that limit to bring life as another form of Adam. So if I look at the letters Yod Kav Lamed and say, he will have the power and capacity to prevail, but we've, we've talked before that Kav Lamed represent the Torah, Torah instructions. Kav, if I open up my hand, but if I put, turn it sideways, I can, I can see lines of written script. That's in my mind. And then Lamed, shaped like the J, or depending on which, you can spin it around any way, but it's a, a shepherd's staff. Push, pull, teach, and learn. Repeat. That's what it means. Lamed, Lameding, Talmud, Talmudim, taught ones. Teach and learn, repeat, go over this stuff again and again. How many times do we have to go through this? Again. <laughs> that's how many times. That's what, he, that's what the word means. So if you'll have the power and capacity to prevail and contain it all, if you add a mem to the next letter, kaf, lamed, mem is where we get the word calamity or calm or everything. It means to be reprehensible, to be, to be destroyed, to be reproached, to be put to shame and humiliated. Just it all falls apart. So if, if he dies and then goes into this degradation of death, ah, don't open that thing up. It stinks. You know, don't, don't, Lazarus is in there three days. It's like just... He's rotting, he's decaying, he's foul. It's at a, that's the way they should have behaved towards that beautiful, shiny, beautiful, colored, smelled good fruit on the tree. The nachash tricked their thinking, twisted their minds because the word nachash also means shiny and enchanting. And wow, hey, that looks pretty good. They were told not to, but it looked pretty good. Barbecue. Pork smells pretty good, unless you don't like it. If you've if you if you've changed your sense of that, it doesn't. But the point is, so kaf lamed mem is this place of ultimate degradation. But noon is the letter that means jump up, jump through, jump out of like a fish jumping out of water, like a baby being born. Noon is fifty, and so there's this jubilee. Hey, you know we the economy goes back to form. You're out of debt. Your noon is like this. It, it's shaped like a lightning bolt or like this jumping legs and noon. Wow. It's, that's a turnaround from the so I can read these letters and find it. Mem, there's a. Low place of degrading, a degradation of de decomposition of life stopping. Everything started with water. You could say, and this mem means water, mime is water. So this is going back to water. This is a total going back to no particular anything. But then somehow Yahusha somehow had within himself the capacity to blow through that and still be the same him that he was. Though remember when he came back, they didn't recognize him. So his body's face looked different somehow, but it was still him. So somehow the life of the Adam, though it dies, and if it's just Adam, the first nature, it has to stop there at the mem. It just hits a wall of stop. So that being, the Adam in the likeness and the image of Elohim is put to humiliation, shame, and reproach as it dead, dies, stops, subject to that Zioning, not only of the flesh, but of the interior being of the Alephness. But then through the Mem, Yahusha brought this nooning, noon psalmic. If I be lifted up, well, noon psalmic is lifted up. The way Moshe lifted up the serpent on the stick, that's noon psalmic. To look, to, to behold the utterance is noon psalmic. Look at the noon psalmic. That, that's actually, hey, bet. Tet, habet. Think of what he said. Look at look at the spelling of these words. That's all. Ponder the utterance. Psalmic iron is a miraculous escape. 
escape from what? The grave? That would be a pretty miraculous escape, much less when running because people are chasing you. But escaping the lake of fire, that, that's a pretty miraculous escape. That's stomach ions. I and pay, these two letters here, that's the word for bird. But psalmic I and pay means a manifold or branch or diversify, like a manifold, like you put headers on your car engine, different tubes coming out of each cylinder, collected into one, blown out the exhaust. That's that's the manifold. It it's this collect going to one or one going to many, a diversification, like the Protestant denominations, like the 12 tribes. For Israel to be broken into 12 tribes is Samachai and pay. And if he says, I'm going to pass you under the rod, make you pass under the rod, and I'm going to contend with you, well, that word contend is noon shin pei tet. Well, shin pei tet is judgment. But noon is like, well, wait a minute. No, that's balancing the scales. I, I'm, I'm going to put everything. So see, if, if we if we hear the translation voice, I'm going to contend with you like I contend with your fathers and make you pass under the rod. It's like, like... Uh, Fathers in the 1930s and 1940s would take their sons out to the woodshed and beat them with sticks and belts, leather harnesses. I know people had that happen, especially in a previous generation. Not allowed to do that anymore. Eh, some countries, they do it. What I'm saying is that's what it sounds like he's doing. But if you read where he says, I'm taking you to the wilderness of the nations, it's the midbar amim, ayin mem yod mem. Well, ayin mem is nation, but it also is a kinsman group. Goyim is, is nations of other tongues. Amim, Ayin Mem Yod Mem, is kindred peoples. So if he's going to take us to the language of the kindred peoples and divide us into tribes, well, that's not the same thing. And I'm going to contend with you and I'm going to balance the scales. I'm going to make everything. Well, that's a prophecy that's in front of us. So it kind of feels like what he's doing now, isn't it? Aren't we engaged right now in this coming back to the language of the tribes and balancing everything out the truth if that stomach guy and pay zadi is wow the resurrection that's yeshua coming out of the grave pay the mouth opens the mouth of the grave opens yeshua comes out that's like the 12 tribes coming back that's like israel getting banished and scattered to the far corners of the entire earth and he says but i'm going to gather you back he says it right there in ezekiel 20 and it's all over the scripture i'm going to bring you back i'm going to bring you back to the land and Yet if this tribulation and the rapture is in front of us, and when's he going to bring us back to the land? After that? After the seven-year land, some people say. And it's like, if he takes them all up, up into heaven and then brings them back and drops them into the land, okay. But it doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to gather you from wherever and bring you to the land. It's like, well, yeah, a little detour up in the seven, seven-year uh, bridal supper. It's like, well, okay, whatever. I, I, don't, I don't know the agenda. I, I don't know what's on the uh, list, but um, it's something like that. But what I'm saying is that if that's Pezadi coming back, the resurrection, Kuf is raising up, and Reshin Tov is betrothed five minutes, and, and it's to be authorized and licensed, permitted. Permitted to do what? To live, maybe? Permitted to live without the being dogged by our enemies and in his favor instead of his long nose of wrath. Okay, what I just did is went through the entire Hebrew alphabet, letter by letter, and I gave it definition. I gave the letters definition based on the meanings of the names of the letters, based on the placement in the sequence order, the chronological order of the alphabet. And the alphabet then if Kaf and Lamed is the Torah, and if the Yod Kaf Lamed, he'll have power and capacity to prevail and contain it all. And if Yahusha kept the Torah, hence being Mashiach, qualifying him, Mashiach, the, the tangible communication, he was he was the guy that wouldn't have betrayed a single word because it's his stuff. Doing everything he hears his father saying and sees his father doing, and then he says, hey, walk like me. Do exactly what I do, and you'll prevail also. You'll do even greater miracles because I'm here keeping a certain agenda, a certain formula. I got to do this, this, and this at this time and this time. And then I've got this thing, this program I'm here to do. But you guys, man, you should be doing all this stuff too. And if that's the case, then where are we? Are we about to do all that stuff? And it's like, because that's what's written. Well, for me to define the alphabet as what's written, 
and the the the, the het around the Mishkan pattern. Well, that's Gedar. Gimel Dalit Resh is to put a fence around something. So to put a fence around that Mishkan pattern, letters het through Zadi, then you got the kuf like the pillar of fire, and you got the red heifer sacrifice that plays the Zion. You got picture Yeshua coming down, Yeshua coming back, and us being raised up to his status, which is, kuf is elevating up to the Resh status. It's giving a definition for a reason. It's not just shiny stuff. Hey, isn't that beautiful? But it's having a reason. And somehow having a definition that you understand resonates deeper than just something sweet or shiny on the surface. As tantalizing as that might be, there's something about understanding. There's something about having definition. So if he wrote Gadar Gadar, he could say give definition to definition, which is what we just did. Well, it says in this verse, Ezekiel 22, verse 30, that Yahweh looked for any man that would do this, and he couldn't find one. So because of that, verse 31, because he couldn't find a single person, he poured out his furious wrath and destroyed everything. You could say that that happened at Noah's flood. He called Nebuchadnezzar his drawn sword. And he destroyed his people. He destroyed animals and men and cities and men, women, children, babies. He destroyed them all. Furious. Why? If he would have found somebody that would get our Gadar, it would have given him somehow a mishpat, a balancing of scales, a legal excuse to not have to do that. But at that time in Ezekiel 22, he couldn't find it. So if I project that time as being now, and there's some stupid, hellacious stuff going on, some stupid stuff going on in this world, and it probably deserves to get destroyed. But come on, how are you going to destroy the righteous as well as the wicked? Yeah, there are no righteous. Yeah, that's what they said. And it's like, well, are you going to destroy your people called by your name as well as everybody else? Well, I got to find a Gadar Gadar. I'm suggesting that's what this is, this, this, this study. It sure looks like Gadar Gadar. And it looks like we just Gadar the Aleph Bet, gave it definition. So we got to take a break, and then we'll pick up with that. <laughs>